don't have them yet. OK, and so with that, I think we can start this new session on hardware. Um, the next talk, uh, the slides are going to come up in a second, uh, is called Everybody Be Cool. This is a robbery given by Jean-Baptiste Pedrun. Please be calm, enjoy the session, and talk to you in a bit. Hi, everyone. So my name is Jean-Baptiste Bedrin. Uh, today I will talk about HSM security. This is, um, maybe this one is better. This is a joint work with Gabriel Campana. We are both security researchers um, at Ledger. I cannot pass the slides. So. <laughs> And uh, we got the opportunity to evaluate an HSM. We found uh, vulnerabilities inside. So in this presentation, uh, I will explain the bugs we found, uh, how we exploited them, and uh, more importantly, the methods we employed for, for that. So first, I, I will describe uh, what is an HSM and the specificities of the HSM we evaluated. As most of our work is focused on uh, the security of PKCS 11, I will introduce the standard. Uh, I will explain then why we had to develop a few tools uh, to um, improve the security analysis of the device. And then I will talk about uh, the bugs we found and how we exploited them uh, to fully compromise the device and actually extract uh, all, of the, all of its uh, secrets. So what is an HSM? An HSM is a um, hardware device that, is, that protects your keys. Uh, it is able to generate, store, and uh, use cryptographic keys. Um, it is a physical device. It can be either an inter internal uh, device, such as a PCI card, PCI Express card, or an external device, such as a ne network appliance, for example. And it contains uh, one or more cry crypto processors to speed up or to secure operation, cryptographic operations. And also, um, almost all of, all of them can, can, uh, have uh, anti-tempering countermeasures to prevent physical attacks uh, on the device. So uh, why, are they, uh, why are they used? They are used in many applications. The most prominent one is PKI on public key infrastructures. The certificate authority is stored into the HSM, at least its private key. And all the certificates that are uh, delivered by, by, this, by this CI uh, are actually signed by, uh, by an HSM. They can also be found in bank, bank environment, for example, to verify your CVV when, when you do a transaction, uh, transaction or to personalize your, your credit card. They can also be seen in telco uh, to authenticate your, your device on the, on the net operator network. And uh, actually, in many places where a long-term key uh, must be really uh, protected. So you can find them in many places, but there's not much public uh, security research uh, on the subject. Why? I'd say first that uh, is that they are expensive. So uh, actually, no security lab can just buy an, H an, an HSM and perform an assessment on it just for testing. Um, second. Um, they protect secrets, and uh, they're often uh, disconnected from a corporate network, and uh, most often out of scope during uh, penetration tests, as companies do not, do, do not want to lose all of their secrets during, during a pen test, because it can uh, wipe itself if it detects an attack. And uh, uh, at last, uh, there are a few vendors that uh, sell HSM, and uh, none of them provide uh, detailed internal information about uh, the way it works. So it's actually a big black box, and uh, we have no idea of uh, it's, uh, their internals. So we got the opportunity to evaluate an HSM. You can see it on the picture on the right, and uh, in, in red. Uh, so this is an internal HSM, a PCI Express card. And uh, what you can see is that it's uh, all black. You, you see nothing. All the components that are covered by epoxy resin. 
So you, you do not have uh, direct, ac uh, direct access to the, to the components. And if you try to remove the epo epoxy resin, it will be detected, and the device uh, will wipe all of its secrets, right? This HSM is certified, uh, FIPS uh, 142 level three. We'll see that later. And uh, it has a, an, an Ethernet controller without connector. Actually, this HSM exist, uh, exists in two form factors, a network appliance and a PCI Express card. And we think it is actually the same device, except that in our case, the Ethernet con connector is not soldered. The other one, we think it's the same and closed in a, in a, in a server. So we, we, put, we put it in a standard Linux server install the modules, uh, kernel modules provided by the vendors and the utilities and started our research on it. So um, briefly, I explained how uh, you, co you communicate with the HSM. You must write a client that will use the library provided by the vendor. This library will, will issue uh, calls to, to the kernel. They will be transferred to the memory at, of the HSM using a shared JRAM stored on the HSM memory. The HSM will process this transa transaction, uh, execute the crypt cryptographic operation, and will send back the, the result to, to the host system. So uh, all the transactions are performed uh, on the initiative on the client, of the client. So this, is, this can be seen as a classic uh, client-server architecture. Uh, as I said, um, the HSM is certified. And uh, what I can say about that is, is that the certification is only about hardware attacks. So uh, as I said, if you try to attack uh, using a hardware attack, it will wipe itself and you will lose all of its secrets. But this is not a certification about software attacks. So that means that if you try to attack using software methods, this device, it is, you, you, know, you have uh, no insurance that it will be safer than an uncertified device. So uh, I introduced our device. I will not talk about uh, PKCS 11 as uh, most of our research is uh, about the, the subject. So what is PQSCS 11? It is a standard uh, in, invented by RSA Security that aims to provide a generic interface to communicate with a crypt cryptographic device. This device can be a smart card, an HSM, something able to uh, perform crypt cryptographic operations. It is a portable API. It defines a, uh, an, an API which is named CryptoKey. And it's a, this is a portable API. That means that the code to communicate with a, with a cryptographic device that supports PKCS 11 will be the same for every device. However, however the implementation can be uh, very different. You, uh, you will not have the same stack if you communicate with a smart card uh, and uh, with an HSM. And the uh, same uh, various HSM have a very different stack. Uh, it defines uh, APIs to perform cryptographic operations. These operations can be uh, any kind of crypt cryptographic operations, encryption, decryption, signatures, key generation, and so on. So the API is not that big, only a few dozen of functions in the standard. So the attack surface, attack surface on the device doesn't look very big. But actually, most of these functions can be, can, can be parameterized using mechanisms. And there are uh, many, many uh, mechanisms defined as a standard, more than, more than 300, and vendors also add their own mechanism to get a very rich uh, functionalities. So actually, the attack surface is much bigger than what we expected uh, at the beginning. What are mechanisms? Mechanisms define a way to perform a cryptographic operation. So a mechanism for encryption, decryption, uh, wrapping keys, and so on. And this mechanism really depends on the device uh, that we consider. For example, a smart card will have very few mechanisms. Mm, maybe uh, one mechanism to generate an RSA key, one mechanism to encrypt using FreeDesk, and uh, one mechanism to, um, uh, to, sign, uh, to sign data. And that's all. Uh, however, an HSM uh, has much more functionalities. It will, it will support many more uh, ciphers. It will support encrypt, uh, authenticated encryptions, for example and uh, higher, level, uh, higher level constrictions. And we, it will also uh, possess custom mechanisms that, uh, that will be used in um, uh, telco or in bank environments. Uh, all these mechanisms uh, require uh, take objects as, as parameters. What are objects? There are three types of objects defined in, this, in the standard. 
uh, keys that can be uh, secret, public, or private keys, certificates, and data that can be uh, actually arbitrary data, but most of the time it is uh, domain par parameters used by DSA and uh, ECDSA. So what uh, interests us uh, as, an, as attackers is uh, obviously the keys, the secret and private keys. And crypto key manipulates objects through their handles. Uh, if you want to, so if you want to, to uh, perform a cryptographic operation, uh, for example, your client uh, wants to encrypt data, first you generate a key on the HSM, you request the HSM to generate a key, the HSM uh, will store the key in, in its memory and send, send back a handle to the client. The client then will um, send the data to be encrypted with the handle of the key previously generated, and the HSM will send back the encrypted results. So uh, at no time, the key is sent back to the client. It always stays in the memory of the HSM, right? This is important for the rest of the presentation. Uh, objects are composed of attributes. Uh, each object has, an, has a class attribute that defines its role, and the other attributes depend on, the, on that class. For example, here is a private uh, ECDSA key. Uh, you can see it has a value attribute. The, 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 the value of the key is actually an attribute. And uh, you, you can get its role. It can be used for, for, for signing in that case, not for encryption. And uh, these attributes are uh, critical for security. For example, an object that has a sensitive attribute, uh, the value of this object cannot be extracted in plain text. It must be wrapped with another key. Uh, for example, a key, uh, usually a key that stays in the, in the HSM. You have an extractable attri attribute. If the object is not extractable, you its value can never be extracted, even uh, if it's wrapped with another key. And uh, another inter interesting attribute is a private attribute. It means that the user has to be logged in to access the object. Each object belongs to a, uh, a token. What are tokens? Uh, actually, when a user wants to log in into the HSM, it logs to a slot. What is a slot uh, and a token? Actually, to the token was the object uh, at the beginning that uh, contains uh, the uh, cryptographic objects like a smart card, and the slot was a physical device that uh, uh, is used to access the token. In that case, it was a smart card reader. In the uh, case of an HSM, the uh, difference is a bit blurry. Actually, you, let's say that you, are, you have several slots on the HSM. Each slot has one token, and the uh, objects are bound to a token. For example, if a user connects to the token on the left, you will only be able to access the object that belongs to that token and not uh, to the object that belongs to the token on the right. Okay? So from there, we can define a few threats. Uh, for example, an attacker uh, th that logs, logs into a to token must not be able to uh, get the keys from another token. An attacker who, extract, uh, who tries to read uh, the value of an unextractable key, uh, this is an attack. But uh, we will consider a much simpler model. In, the, in our case, uh, we are in the position of an attacker who has no credential information, only unauthenticated, unauthenticated access, and we want to access uh, all the crypt cryptographic data from other slots uh, and to dump all the keys. Um, so, uh, the, the PKCS11 PKCS has been uh, quite studied a lot in the previous years. Our work is a bit different. We do not uh, look at the security of the standard, but uh, the security of an implementation uh, on a single HSM. Uh, moreover, we uh, give uh, an insight of the inter internals of, uh, of a given HSM. So, let's start now with the vulnerability research. Uh, we consider uh, that we are in a position where we, are com we have compromised uh, a host that is able to talk uh, with, the, with the HSM card. But we have no login information about it. We started uh, using the software provided by, by the vendor. 
for the CD-ROM that, that contained uh, an SDK and a, and a few code samples. And what was very interesting for us is that it contains also a firmware update, and that firmware update was uh, just signed and not encrypted. And it was uh, quite easy to extract, and we, show, uh, we, we saw that it was running actually an old Linux kernel that was released 10 years ago, so we were sure that um, everything was not really up to date on, on that device. It contains uh, a big library that, contain, uh, that actually uh, embedded all the CryptoKey implementation, and we spent a few weeks uh, doing uh, reverse engineering at, on, that, uh, on that library. Uh, this was uh, not enough to get precise insight of uh, the internals of the device. And uh, looking at, at the features, we, we, got, we saw an, an expected op option on this device is that we are able to load code on it uh, using custom models. The usage for this is to implement new mechanisms, for example, to filter a few messages or things like that. This is not a vulnerability in itself. You must be admin to be able to upload a custom module. This is re really a feature. And uh, we developed two modules to gain information about the device. The first one was a shell. We modified uh, BuzzyBox to, get, uh, to, to be able to launch uh, various commands on the device. And from a black box, we got something like that looked like a user-friendly device. Uh, we developed then a debugger a modified version of a GDB server. Um, this was a bit tricky because uh, we, uh, because uh, actually the main process is responsible for, uh, to communi for the communication with the outside world, with the host. And if we debug it, we have no way to communicate with the outside world. So uh, we uh, had to develop, a, we had to create an auxiliary channel to, to be able to uh, talk with the host even uh, when debugging the, the main process. Uh, that worked, finally. And what we saw is that everything ran as root uh, on the device, and so there, was no, there are no hardening, no mitigation options, so no ASLR, no stack cookie, and so on. So that means that uh, every uh, exploitable vulnerability can be enough to uh, extract uh, all the secrets. Let's see later. We wanted then to understand uh, how sensitive data and cryptographic objects were, were stored on this device. Actually, all the persistent data is stored in a flash memory on the P PCI card. Uh, what interests us is the PCI C11 object. They are stored in a single partition, dedicated page partition, that uses a proprietary file system. And uh, actually, all the objects are stored in plain, te plain text on that partition, but sensitive attributes, uh, all the sensitive attributes are encrypted using a key which is external to the flash. It is located in another component on the right. So uh, when you try to attack the HSM uh, and uh, the, it is detected, that key is immediately destroyed and uh, then if you dump the flash, manage to dump the flash physically, actually you will get only access to public information. All the sensitive da data will be encrypted and you, you won't have a key for to read, to read it. But that also means that there's a single key for all the objects, all the sensitive attributes. So there's actually no logical separation across the HSM slots. Uh, so uh, actually, if we manage to get uh, code execution on the device, we should be able to extract and to decrypt all the secrets uh, on the device. So let's go. The, the, First thing we did was to uh, get a, to find sim simple vulnerability on the device. So we looked at uh, basic memory co corruption bug, uh, stack-based buffer overflows. We did manual analysis on it, and we grabbed uh, we grabbed mem calls to memcopy uh, to find a vulnerable call to memcopy. And actually, uh, there was uh, several hundreds of calls to memcopy, but this can be done quite easily manually uh, with uh, after a couple of hours we managed to, to find uh, there was a single call that was uh, actually vulnerable to Stack Overflow in the middle age uh, deriv derivation mechanism. This is an algorithm that is used in, uh, by telco operators. Uh, this is a UMTS authentication algorithm. Uh, 
in that case, uh, in the pseudocode at the bottom of the screen, you can see that uh, there's a value of a, of a key that is retrieved, and the size of this object is, uh, of this attribute is never checked, and uh, the value of the attribute is di directly copied on a vari variable AES key on the, on the stack. That means uh, if you uh, generate a, a big key on the device and you use it uh, for, to derive a new key with millionage, it will tr trigger a stack, stack overflow. From there, actually, code execution is uh, very easy because there's no stack cookie on the device and no ASLR. But uh, if, you, if you try to exploit it, actually, you will, you will corrupt a lot, a lot of da data on the stack. So uh, resuming execution will be a bit difficult. And you have to be uh, logged in to be able to call this mechanism with a, uh, with a specific key. Uh, moreover, the, this bug is only present, uh, this algorithm is only present in the late, latest version of the, of, the, of the HSM. So we thought it would be a better idea to, to look for another bugs. And for that, uh, we were a bit uh, pissed with uh, manual analysis. So we started uh, to write further. We imitated the message uh, sent uh, from, by the client to the HSM. And uh, we actually wrote, uh, wrote uh, a dump further that does a random byte mutation on, on the device. And uh, there were, the further is, is simple, but there were two main challenges. The first one is that the kernel module on the client side is not very robust, and uh, actually we crashed the kernel of our host uh, between, uh, before sending correct da data to the HSM. So this was the first problem. Second one is that uh, by modifying uh, some bytes on the data that, that was sent to the HSM, we triggered a um, big memory all allocation, and uh, the HSM had no memory, and we got a lot of uh, out-of-memory errors, and that was not interesting for a security point of view. So we had to filter all of these messages. But finally, we got a decent further that found uh, 14 vulnerabilities, 14 different vulnerabilities on this device, uh, all of them uh, were more or less exploitable. All of them were memory cor corruption bugs. I, I will present two of, two of them now. The first one is uh, quite similar to Heartbleed, which was a vulnerability in OpenSSL that allowed you, for example, to dump the content of the memory of a, of a server and to retrieve its private key. Here we, are, we have uh, quite the same bug, and we are able to, to dump the memory heap of the HSM. You can see here, blah, uh, on, the, on the top of the screen is actually the password of the um, admin slot uh, we, 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 we put on the device. So we can get really sensitive um, information like uh, password and maybe uh, encryption keys. But this bug is not very interesting for us because you need to be authenticated to, to trigger it, and that does not give you a code execution. So we found another bug. We looked at... Uh, an interesting mechanism, which is serialization on the, on the HSM. Actually, you, you are able to start an operation, then to pause it and to resume it later. So you start, for example, a hashing operation on the device. Uh, you, you say that you want to restore it later, and the HSM will, will send you its state uh, on the client. Then you send back the state to the HSM, uh, to, to restore the, the operation. And actually, if you mutate the state, you get a, a strange crash. At first, we, we think it was uh, just a null deref byte, uh, null deref um, vulnerability, which is not interesting for a security point of view because it's usually not exploitable. But uh, the stack trace was a, a, a bit um, unusual, and we dig a bit and um, so that it was not a null deref, but actually a type confusion bug. So actually the byte, uh, which is encircled in red, is the type of the digest you, you, you are restoring. And if you change it, you can actually uh, uh, restore a different uh, hash object uh, that's the one that was uh, previously saved. And that um, allows you to call uh, different methods on that object and to trigger some bug. We, from this uh, primitive, from this bug, we managed to get two primitives. One was a read primitive that allowed you to dump the heap of the HSM. The other one was a relative write primitive 
that allowed us to write data uh, located after the state that had been restored. So uh, I won't go into details, but uh, by allocating uh, several objects on the HSM and by triggering the bug, we were able to corrupt uh, the memory of other objects and then get, get code execution for, from that. So once we had uh, code execution without any authentication, we had to develop a, a payload because uh, this is just the beginning of, uh, of the adventure. Uh, and uh, this payload had to be specific because uh, the usual payload, like uh, running a shell or uh, trigger a network connection, doesn't work because there's no shell on this device and no network connection. So we thought a bit uh, and we came to the conclusion that the easiest stuff to do was just to disable pin verification on the device so that the attacker can just uh, log in without uh, any password. And that worked. And from there, we have admin rights, and we can use the custom module uh, feature to upload uh, a, a bigger library that is able to do what we want. For example, uh, dump the wool, uh, flash, uh, wool content of, of the flash and dump the encryption key that is needed to uh, decrypt the, 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 the flash. And this exploit is a single binary executed from the host. And it allows to uh, get all the uh, cryptographic keys from the HSM in plain text. We wanted to follow our analysis by looking at uh, the way the signature, uh, the firmware was loaded uh, on, onto the HSM. Actually, uh, I will start first with uh, the signature verification of the custom module you can, you can install of the device because this is quite the same mechanism. So, uh, when you want to install a module, you uh, first generate a certificate on the client and you send it to the HSM. The HSM stores uh, the certificate and sends back a, a certificate handle to the client. Then the client sends uh, the module it wants to load, which must be signed with, with the certificate, with the handle of the certificate. If the, signature, if the signature is correct, the HSM uh, stores the module and loads it into memory and executes it. It is almost the same for firmware updates, except that firmware updates can only be issued by the vendor. You cannot uh, load your own firmware. And here is the process. Instead of supplying your own certificate, the client looks for an object with, which has a custom attribute on the HSM. This is a specific attribute that cannot be set by uh, any, any user. And there are a single object that contains this uh, attribute. This is the certificate that is used uh, to verify uh, firmware. The client then sends uh, send back the handle to, the, to that certificate with the, with the firmware data. And the HSM verifies the signature again. And if it's valid, uh, writes the firmware to the flash loads the firmware and reboots. But actually, there's a logical bug here. Uh, when the cli client sends the firmware data with a certificate, the HSM never check that the attribute is present on the cert certificate object. So actually, you can install any dummy certificate and provide a, way, uh, provide a handle to that certificate along with the firmware data to bypass uh, the firm uh, firmware signature on the HSM. So you can actually load any firmware on the device. So uh, to be able to do that, you have to be admin. You have to be admin. But uh, with, with the previous vulnerabilities I explained, you can be admin. From there, you can install a, a persistent uh, backdoor on the, on the firmware. And this is actually a critical bug because uh, this attack cannot be patched easily because if the vendor uh, patches the signature ver verification mechanism, uh, you can still upload a new, um, an older uh, firmware to the HSM that will be accepted and trigger the uh, signature verif verification bypass on it and load your backdoor firmware. So, as a conclusion, oh. as a conclusion, I. Uh, I explained how we were able uh, to trigger memory corruption bug that leads to a complete compromise of the HSM. 
and to dump all of its secrets. We are not sure uh, this, the bugs we found also uh, work on uh, the network version of the HSM. We think uh, it will be the case, but we, we cannot be sure yet. Uh, we were able to dump the whole storage of the device and to decrypt all the secrets that it contained. We show a way to by bypass the signature verification of the firmware and uh, a way to, uh, uh, to break uh, the integrity uh, of the device. And we think this is hard to fix. All the bugs have been disclosed to the vendor. Uh, it patched, uh, the vendor patched all of the bugs in a few months, and uh, the software should be safer now. Uh, so I want to point out this is not an exhaustive HSM study. We only studied one model from one vendor, but uh, we hope that our methodology can be used uh, by other researchers to perform the same assessment on, on other models. Finally, I would say that uh, most uh, HSM uh, are protected against all attacks, but this is, in our opinion, uh, not, not enough. You have also to uh, be protected against software attacks. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Uh, so we don't have to uh, outlaw crypto, we can just send your talk to the FBI, right? So, sorry, I didn't understand. <laughs> Any other questions up there? <laughs> okay. Uh, if nothing else, then please let's uh, thank the speaker again. I think so. The oh, last question. One Sorry. Yes, one last one. I understand you. You were two two guys working on it. How yes. long did it take you to do all this? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I'd say once one summer, one summer, including holidays, so two months is. Do you have a next target already? <laughs> <laughs> we 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 will we'll be glad to follow our study on other devices, but we have no other devices and actually no, no time to to spend on, on that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think I just broke. So the next one is TPM fail. TPM meets timing and lattice attacks by Daniel Mogimi, our speaker, Berg Sunar, Thomas Eisenbart, and Nadia Henninger. And let's see if what we can do now remotely, maybe. <laughs> Hello. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for attending my talk. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about TPM fail, uh, which shows some critical vulnerabilities on one of the most uh, popular hardware security products. Uh, uh, this is a joint work with uh, Berg Sunar, Thomas Eisenberg, and Nadia Henninger. Uh, well, TPMs can be found almost on many, any kind of computing devices, from your laptop to your computer, desktop systems, uh, auto, auto industry, industrial systems. Uh, why, why is it so important to have these trusted platform modules everywhere? Well. We have known for a long time that uh, softwares are vulnerable. We have seen the heart bleed attacks, so, and many different types of attacks, root kits. Uh, we cannot rely on the OS for security. And computers are just evil. Uh, we have seen lots of CPU attacks, so we cannot really rely on the host and the CPU to provide any root of trust for us. So there is a need for hardware-based root of trust. This need has been around for a long time now. And, uh, some people came up with a solution as some security chiefs called Trusted Platform Module, or TPMs, uh, that these TPMs are embedded into your computer, into your laptop, and 
These TPNs are supposed to be tamper resistant, side channel resistant, and they provide some cryptographic functionalities. So you can basically narrow the root of trust, put your cryptographic keys inside this box, and then keep everybody outside of uh, this trusted, this, uh, trusted computing base and uh, root of trust. Uh, so with that, uh, we, we expect lots of cryptography functionalities here. There is an organization called Trusted Computing Group that they provide a standard on uh, what these devices should support, what type of uh, cryptography functionality, and with, with what kind of security guarantees and qualities. Uh, there are uh, random number generators, hash functions, uh, encryption modules, and digital signatures in this, in this type of device. Uh, today, we focus mostly on the digital signature. Uh, well, we only focus on the digital signature. That's what the TPM fail attack is about. Uh, and uh, one thing we mentioned, okay, these devices are supposed to be tamper resistant, side channel resistant, and, uh, but how do we know, th how can we even rely on that? Well, TCG also provides some uh, certification that is, that is done through some organization like FIPS and CC, and, and these certification is, are supposed to guarantee that these devices uh, meet certain quality, certain standards to be protected against attacks. And uh, on the TCG website, you can find a list of devices that are considered uh, to be certified. Uh, but again, as we talked about security, we are obscurity, we don't know anything about how these devices are implemented. They are just black box security chips. Uh, we mentioned digital signatures and uh, how, why do we care about using uh, TPM digital signature? Well, you can just use TPM as a trusted execution environment for digital signatures. Uh, there are lots of different applications like uh, SSH or uh, VPN or, or your email client or server that they can just keep the security key, the digital signature key inside this TPM module and uh, they can ask the TPM module to perform the uh, signature generation. And now the latest, latest version of OpenSSL, the Linux environment, they all support uh, TPM by default. Uh, there is also the FIDO, FIDO Alliance that they basically push to use TPMs uh, for uh, things like, uh, uh, like YubiKey, for things like uh, two-factor authentication, and th these devices all use digital signatures. And the other important thing about uh, digital signatures for TPMs are that they, they need to support remote attestation. For instance, if I want to make sure uh, a party on the other side of the network, on the other side of the world, has a legitimate computer, has a legitimate firmware running, I can actually use the digital signature PKI type of a scheme to verify if the other party is a valid device with a valid TPM firmware and version. Uh, the new version of TPM, TPM version 2, uh, support elliptic curve digital signatures, and this, this has been popular for, for, for a while now. Almost all uh, new laptops and computers since Windows 10 all support TPM2 instead of TPM1.2. Uh, so the question is, the, with these certifications, with all these black box obscurity, are these devices are really secure? Can we really rely on these devices for uh, secure transactions, secure encryption, and, and et cetera, et cetera? Uh, so we did the most simplest and most common sense test to actually see if these devices can handle side channel attacks and so uh, We did a timing test. We want to do a timing test. And uh, the, the first thing we need to do a timing test is a good timer. One way to, to measure the time of uh, a TPM device, for instance, is to use uh, the power signal using oscilloscope and get a very high resolution timer. But uh, that's not very uh, scalable, that's not very easy to use, so we just try to make a timer using the CPU frequency. Uh, we know that the CPU runs much faster than a TPM device because a TPM device is generally based on a small microcontroller, it runs with maybe a, less than 100 uh, megahertz frequency, but uh, our CPU is generally most, more than two, two gigahertz and the, CPU, the TPM is generally attached to our system, so we can just use the CPU cycle count as a, as a timer. Uh, so we did, uh, we started our test when we started this work, like last January, we started, okay, let's look at uh, the most common TPM uh, product on, on, on our computers, which is a product called Intel Platform Trust Technology, or Intel PTT, which is essentially a firmware TPM that is integrated into your CPU. Uh, it has its own processor inside the CPU package. Uh, it runs as part of the management engine, which management engine hasn't been a very trustworthy, secure 
security system in the past, and, but we also rely on this management regime to run the uh, firmware TPM, basically. Uh, but what is important is even if the CPU, uh, uh, the host CPU is compromised, that it doesn't have any access to the management engine directly. Uh, so, and this, ha this has been supported on uh, almost all new operating system, Windows, Linux systems. Um, so we did a simple test. I, I ran the CDSA uh, that, is, uh, that is supported by this uh, firmware TPM and it gave me some distribution, histogram distribution. I was like, okay. Uh, we, did, we did a simple test, and this is clearly not constant time when I measure the timing from the CPU using the CPU cycle count. Uh, for some of the signatures, it runs faster. For some of the signatures, it runs slower. So there is a suspicious that here we are leaking something about the nonce, which is the only thing that, that changed when we signed different uh, messages using the same key. Uh, we created a tool. We modified uh, the Linux kernel stack. Uh, for these uh, TPM devices, and we try to measure the timing of the t TPM operation as close as possible to the interface of these devices. Uh, when we did this measurement, we realized that, okay, the same timing measurement gets to a very clean cut uh, distribution with different peaks, like three or four different peaks, depend how many measurements we do. And, uh, and each peak has a, dis has a frequency, has, a, has a, like 16 times more than the next one, so this kind of gave us uh, the idea that, okay, this ECDSA implementation is probably based on some uh, fixed window implementation and they probably leak something about the nonce. That's, that's the idea that we got from this and this also matched our previous observation of some of other Intel's cryptographic libraries and products. So with this, we got some confidence. I'm like, okay, we have this tool, we're gonna collect uh, some devices in the lab, like desktop computers, some Intel new computers, laptops and run our tool and see, see how do they behave, how do these devices behave when we do a timing test on uh, public key schemes like RSA and CDSA. Uh, among these devices, most of them are used the Intel FTPM. Uh, we even updated these, these devices to the latest version of their firmware, to the latest version of the Intel Management Engine firmware, and we noticed that, okay, the timing behaviors are still there and even other devices have some non-constant time behavior for RSA computation, for ECDSA computation. And most importantly is that, uh, that that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of the talk is Intel FTPM and ST microelectronic uh, devices, they actually have vulnerable ECDSA implementations. So there is a more in-depth analysis of other, other uh, like we analyze RSA and et cetera in the paper. Uh, but to focus on the ACDSA, uh, this time we programmed the device with a noun key instead of using just an unknown key jet that is generated inside the device. And we unblinded the nonce that is used for the signature. And we notice, okay, there is a direct correlation for every additional four bit of leading zero bit in the nonce with the timing operation of this uh, ACDSA computation. And Intel uh, TPM device supports ECDSA, Sushnor, BN256 care, and they were all vulnerable in a similar fashion with just different timing distribution. And then we, we got to this one. This is the timing distribution we got from running ECDSA on the ST Microelectronics TPM device. And at first sight, when I, when I ran this, I, I didn't pay enough attention and I thought it's, uh, it's constant time, it looks like a, uh, normal Gaussian distribution, but th when later on the next day I looked at it more closely, I'm like, okay, it seems like the left side of the, the plot is like the, the, it's less steep, so this is, there is actually a timing behavior here, this is not actually a balanced Gaussian distribution. So similarly, I programmed the device with a noun key and then uh, unblinded the nonces and we no I noticed that, okay, there is actually a direct correlation between the time and every additional leading zero bit in the nonce. Uh, so this time, it's similar for, e for every short nonce, we get a faster time. So if, if I compute ECDSA, if the nonce that is used for that signature is short, the uh, computation is gonna be much faster. So based on this, now that we have two vulnerabilities, we created uh, ad an attack. Uh, this attack, basically, we, we have a template. We know that with what, temp what th threshold these signatures are gonna be biased, how many leading zero bits they're gonna have, and when we have the template, we're gonna collect some signatures from the device, and using the template and the timing samples we have collected, 
We can basically filter the signatures that are biased, uh, that they, they have been generated with a, not, with a biased nuts. And then we applied the standard lattice space attack to, to recover the key from these devices. So in the final attack we did, we actually just, pro just asked the TPM device to generate this key instead of programming it with the non key. Uh, how does the lattice attack work? I, I'm not gonna go to the detail of how, what lattices are and how, how they work, but a uh, general overview is uh, basically we rewrite the ECDSA equation in a way that uh, the public uh, parameters are on one side and, and unknown parameters are on the other side. And then we get this nice small uh, linear equation here, uh, system of equation here. And then uh, we can basically construct a hidden number from, from this because we know that all the nonsense KIs are smaller than some size because we can leak, leak if a signature is generated based on a small nuts. So this is a standard hidden number problem that is introduced many years ago, and it has been studied by many people uh, in, in side general community, in uh, theory community as well. And uh, yeah, and we constructed a lattice uh, like this using the public parameters, and we applied the common LLL and BKZ algorithm to actually extract the keys from these devices. We did some analysis of how efficient are these attacks are on these devices. Uh, for Intel FTPM, uh, we, we did the analysis with three different thread models. Well, for TPM, even a system adversary, even a physical adversary is part of the thread model, but we wanted to see what is the impact of uh, such a timing behavior, like from a user space, from network. Um, and here on the plot, we can see some of the results for the system adversary that, for instance, we can uh, recover, recover the key with a lattice dimension of 80 or, or, or that range of kind of lattice dimension. Uh, so in, uh, in, on Intel FTPM, we could basically recover the private key in like three or four minutes. Uh, and the time is just time to collect the signatures. The computation of the lattice just takes a few seconds because uh, it's, a, a small lattice, uh, it's a small lattice size. Uh, for ST Microelectronics, which is a CC certified device and it's supposed to be protected against timing attacks and side channel attacks, uh, we could recover the key in 80 minutes, uh, which again is the time to collect that amount of signature, 40,000 signatures. And with that, we, we move to, okay, what else can be done with these devices? So timing attacks, remote timing attacks have been demonstrated more than 15 years ago. Uh, there are various work on uh, remote timing attacks on RSA and ACDSA. Uh, and TPMs are very close to like some of the smart cards that they, they used to have a timing issue. But the difference here is if I connect a TPM device to a network, which is a very common scenario, uh, and it has a vulnerability, timing vulnerability, it is gonna be highly exploitable and expose, be exposed to the network because this device runs with a very fr low frequency. So even, even some timing distribution with lots of network noise can be still be observed from a remote adversary. We came up with a case study for this. Uh, we, we looked at some of the like, applications, and one of the applications that actually have default configuration to use TPM is a strong Swan VPN solution. So we use the configuration that is uh, that is provided by, their, by the product, uh, by the software, and we configure the server to use its, uh, its built-in Intel uh, TPM solution to do the authentication with a client. So a malicious client that connects to this VPN server is gonna by default do a DFL monkey exchange, get, get a shared secret, and after that, it needs to authenticate to the server. In this authentication, when the client send its parameters to be assigned by the server, the server is not gonna have the private key in its own memory, and the private key is gonna only exist in the storage, the secure storage of the TPM device. And then uh, the VPN server asks the TPM device, okay, uh, sign this message and uh, give, give me back the response, which is the signature. And then the server is gonna provide the signature to the client, and the client can verify if the server is actually uh, a legitimate server or not. Uh, but at the same time, the client can keep doing that until it collects some number of signatures with timing and timing samples. And every time the client can just drop the communication and try to issue another, another handshake. Uh, with that, the client can basically have enough timing information to learn good amount of information about the TPM 
the private key for the server that was actually only stored in the TPM device. So we did an analysis of this attack, and we actually managed to recover the private key from a server after like 44,000 handshakes. And it took us five hours to do a remote timing, timing attack in this very practical scenario. And uh, five hours for a remote attack on a TPM device is, is, is something that I would say it's not good in 2020 as, as like a result, really. Uh, yeah, so in, uh, in this case, we could basically recover the uh, TPM, uh, the key basically uh, in like with uh, 60, 70% success probability, uh, for instance, with the lattice dimension of 90. So with that, uh, I would like to also show a comparison of different timing distribution we did in, the, in our work. Uh, so we, we build up our attack like eventually. We started with the system adversary. Okay, the system adversary gets a side channel leakage that is almost perfect. There is no, there is no noise. We can just uh, use this to recover the key in a very predictable way. And then as we do the measurement harder, as we make the scenario stronger, we basically have some noise. For instance, the user adversary, we can see in the like, blue, blue one that, okay, there are, there's, there are more noise. Or, or we also implemented our own a small network application, which doesn't have any handshake or protocol, and we saw that, okay, we can still recover the key. And finally, we saw that, okay, even with a real application, the timing distribution is too good that we can still recover the key. Uh, so we, did, we went through the responsible disclosure. We first reported our first finding to Intel. Intel acknowledged the receipt, and they actually told us the reason this was vulnerable is they were using an outdated version of their Intel IPP cryptography library. And this library, we actually reported similar issue to this, about this library to Intel maybe one or two years ago, but this shows that even the vendors sometimes they forgot to update their own products that they're, they're using uh, their own cryptography libraries. Uh, so a firmware update came out in, uh, in November as we released this uh, issue, and uh, if anybody using CDSA and uh, Intel product, they really need to update their firmware to, to avoid this vulnerability. Uh, we also reported this issue, uh, ST microelectronic uh, vulnerability to ST. Uh, they were quite surprised that this is even possible. Uh, they acknowledged the receipt. They acknowledged that, okay, it's fine, you're right. And we had lots of calls, lots of emails to clarify, okay, that's the disclosure process. Uh, surprisingly, they never had any experience, anybody report any vulnerability to them. Or knowing what is this process for responsible disclosure, uh, which maybe it shows how good they are in terms of, I don't know, producing products. Uh, so, we verified that the new version that they patched this issue and they provided us with a new uh, device and we verified that, okay, the new version that they patched now is secure against our attack uh, last September. Uh, and since then, uh, there are two OEM vendors that they, they have issued firmware patch for this issue. And ST also released a list of devices that they were vulnerable to, to, this, uh, to this problem. And if anybody, I don't know, in the industry, in the car manufacturing or Every place that there is no update for this firmware, they really need to take cautions and actually go and uh, fix this problem and up use an updated version of this device. Uh, there is also a challenge here, uh, which if anybody is interested in looking at this, we noticed that the Intel, the Infineon TPM device, which is even a more popular dedicated uh, TPM solution, also has a timing variation in their CDSA computation. But with the test we did, we couldn't find any proper correlation between the nonce and the timing behavior. Uh, but it could be something that we, we didn't pay enough attention to it. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, take questions. There is the link to the website, the source code, and uh, this paper is gonna be also presented in, at the next Usenix conference in Boston uh, the upcoming summer. Thank you. Okay, questions. Kenny. Hello, thank you for the great talk. Um, could you say a little bit about how remote the server was, or the client was, sorry, in the remote attack setting? So how, many, we, how many hops? Yeah, yeah, so we, we configured a switch and, a, and two computers 
that they are talking to each other over this uh, normal gigabit switch. Via switch, a, yes. single, a single switch? Yeah. OK, good, good luck doing it in a WAN. You can try. Yeah. Why I think, uh, yeah, on cloud environment or, yeah. Yeah, most of the time, the host chip and the TPM chip are separate. <laughs> uh, what kind of uh, mechanism we have to make sure that communication is secure too? So that communication, I, I've seen some people have done some work on tapping on the LPC bus and, uh, for instance, uh, leaking things there. But uh, in this particular case that we are attacking the public signatures, we don't care even if that communication is, is not secure because the, the secrets, which are the nonce and the private key, they will never be even communicated from the TPM device and the CPU. Uh, but in other case scenarios, for instance, some people may try to send the private key to the TPM device or may use the TPM device in a way that, okay, they program the device, then yet yeah, the communication against can be tapped and, and uh, that's, that's an attack that has been known actually for a long time. Okay, thank you. So for your last question, so you said that there is no correlation uh, between the time and the nonce, the waste of nonce. Did you check if there is any correlation with the inverse of the nonce? We, we did some, some checks, like for instance, we did uh, bit, bit frequency correlation test and we did uh, leading zero bit test uh, and we couldn't find anything with that. Uh, but that could work, that the, the one you say that maybe there is a reverse correlation or Another thing we thought maybe there could be an encoding before using the nonce. Like they may encode the nonce to some boot recording or WNAF representation and then they could do the computation. Uh, but we, did, we, we really just ran out of time and energy to actually do more analysis. Thank you. A question to Serge, why would you suggest the inverse of the nonce? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Okay, other questions? I maybe have one. Did you, in your discussions with the vendors, uh, suggest fixes to them, or did they come up with them and you check whether it would work, or? So with Intel FTPM uh, in 2008, 18, like, well, just a couple of years ago, last year, we shared a tool with the MicroVoc and we analyzed their cryptography library and we already found, found a similar issue then. And they already fixed it, fixed it there. So the only thing they had to do was to update the firmware, which was a surprise for us that it took nine months for them and they asked us for such a long embargo date. Uh, with ST Microelectronics, they gave us a new TPM device with a new laptop and then we verified it and like, okay, this is now fixed. Okay, okay. thank you very Thanks. much then. Thanks again. trouble here. Oh, you just can't turn it to the side. Okay. <laughs> Easy. Okay, our uh, next and last speaker um, is, today. for today, <laughs> is Roberto Avanzi. He's going to talk about memory protection um, for the ARM architecture. All right. Hello and good afternoon. So actually what I will be talking about today is for general purpose computing, but since I work for an employee that shares my initials, I will have to specify that what we have been doing is on the ARM architecture. Um, so how does the remote work? This is supposed to work. Ah, the other one. Oh. This one. So. Um, so this work has been done by people at the TARDIS, that's my, my, my team at ARM, stands for Team for Analysis, Research and Development in Security, together with a host of other people from various institutions and also other companies that are in our partnership. And building and standing on the shoulders of a few giants that have worked on this area for us before. So the, the topic of my talk will be confidentiality of memory contents, and now this comes a mouthful, 
and memory integrity violation detection. And why? Why am I about to stand between you and the reception? Well, the reason is that uh, memory contents are important. We are stakeholders that put some of our assets in the memory of a computer. And as soon as you have this, well, you have a security problem. And so the usual cat and mouse game begins. So RAM can be read by software, then use access control. Um, you have called the boot or platform reset attacks. Then encrypt things. Use ephemeral keys to avoid things to be correlated across boots. Uh, do you have attacks that can adaptively modify the contents of your memory? Then use some freshness so that you encrypt the same thing twice, you get different things. We have seen these, uh, these things t this morning when uh, um, Iwata-san uh, gave his fantastic speech. And of course, add integrity to prevent these modifications. And indeed, this is not a new problem at all. Uh, there are bound, there's a great abundance a great affluence of commercial and academic solutions starting from the seminar work on XOM, Edges, Edges version 2, Bastion, and going to commercial solutions like SGX, Secure, Blue Plus Plus, and many others. So to be clear, I'm a technical person at arm, and I'm not announcing any product, no any feature today. It's not my job, and my employer pays handsomely other people to do this. But of course, we would just be a giant bunch of idiots if we were not studying this problem. So I will be limiting myself to tell you what we have studied to protect memory contents cryptographically. OK, security problem. Let's talk about threat models. And there is a big misconception sometimes. People say, well, we have client devices and infra devices, which means everything that is in cloud, the edge, the fog. This is the wrong assumption, because memory protection is always needed when the owner of some software or some data does not want the internal state of their stuff to leak or to be tampered with while it is running and beyond. This might be some software module running on your device, handling some DRM scheme, but it could also be your application or virtual machine running in the cloud. And there is something in common between these two scenarios. In both scenarios, the software runs on somebody else's computer. And in both scenarios, again, an attacker might use software running on the same platform or some hardware manipulation to get at your stuff. And even the hardware's owner can be an adversary. Never trust somebody that says, trust us, it is running on my platform, and I'm keeping it safe. So what is in the security perimeter, and what is not? Well, OK, the CPU is there, fine. The boot ROM, of course, it must be there, otherwise it can't configure anything for security. And what else? Well, there are two scenarios where one splits into two uh, on, on its own. Uh, the first one is that the memory might be internal, which means it is on the same die as the CPU, or it is package in package, pip, in the same package as the CPU masters that need to process the stuff, maybe with some anti-tamper measures. In this case, you cannot interpose the memory. You can put some, can't put really something very easily at least between the CPU and the memory. So you can assume that the memory device is essentially trusted because it is inside your security perimeter. So the threats are mostly called boot attacks and platform reset attacks. And variant of this scenario, you might want to consider things like raw hammer or fault injection as attacks that can be mounted on your device. Hello? The second one is when the memory is external. That means it could be socketed. It could be sold on the motherboard, look, these guys, which of course I have, I have no idea who they are. They designed these things that you could price a square on the, on the motherboard, and they have the two chips, but they are sold on the motherboard. They are close to the chip, but they are sold on the motherboard. They actually did this on an iPad. Uh, or you can have the package on package. So you put something on a ball grid and lay on your motherboard, and it also has a socket on its own, and you put something atop. In all these cases, you can actually easily interpose memory. Um, and don't trust people that say this attack is difficult. So 
threads here are augmented by actually bus reading and memory transaction tampering. But we are lucky, there are easy solutions, and I already mentioned them a couple of slides ago. So you encrypt all the memory. Okay, you are considering some easy modifications of the memory, some fault injection, raw hammer, well then hash all the memory. And if you want to defend yourself against those attackers that can actively modify things and replace stuff into your memory, then hash also the hashes, and you get the Merkle tree. By the way, it was very nice today to see Ralph Merkel. So we are celebrating. I did not know. I did not know he was to be here. So that's really a coincidence. I didn't have it this morning. So we are done. And you can go to the reception, right? Uh, are we? Are we done? No, actually. And why is the thing? Well, you know, stuff costs. You develop things. You put things into silicon. You had some hashes and things, and this is going to make performance slow. And there is a very, very sad truth in, in our business. Because there are two things that nobody expects. Which is the first one? Nobody expects? What? No, the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> the second thing that nobody expects is that any piece of technology that kills performance and wastes memory or disk or whatever, for whatever purpose, will ever be widely deployed, unless it is, of course, some spyware, hardware, or bloatware, including blockchains. <laughs> I had a much harsher joke here, but a uh, legal at the company told me, no, 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 don't, don't, call, don't call them what you're saying, use this word, okay, so. So we have some nice solutions already in the market for these. So for instance, SGX has a very sound cryptographic protection. So Intel guys, it, I'm actually, you are, we are competitors of us actually making a compliment for you. Uh, but there is a 26.7 memory overhead and a 25% performance penalty in our, in our testing. On the other end of, this, end of the spectrum, you have the secure um, extensions for virtualization or something like that by MD which on paper offers you much better performance, uh, no memory overheads, but encryption is not announced and there is no integrity. So it is almost as if you had nothing there. So I decided to try to have something, let's say, ideally, with the first level of security with a second performance impact. And so I started a project which is called the Moped at Arm. It stands for memory opacification. This word exists, look in the Merriam-Webster. Performance evaluation and design. And so as uh, any project of this kind, it contains a survey of the state of the art, um, new ideas, because we are an IP company, benchmarking and selecting the winners. So let's start. The first thing was to collect the requirements. So we had to consider confidentiality. And for this, we want top secret security level against various types of adversaries. Why? You say, well, you have live things, you have things in memory and things at rest. The second one needs a better protection, which is wrong, because an attacker will always try to take the lowest hanging fruit. So if you're using a weaker cryptographic protection to store some important data while it is in memory, then you grab it from the memory and not from the disk. We want 20 years of classical security at minimum and adequate post-quantum resistance if we can do that without spending a penny which means we want at least 128, some actually 80 bits of security, both classical and post-quantum, which means 256 bits worth of keys because post-quantum. For integrity, we take the Wikipedia definition, it shall be computationally infeasible to corrupt memory but forging uh, the integrity structure. And we have the same time restrictions on that observation, and we can talk that offline. We concluded that you needed 60 bits for the max, not 56 as some of our competitors, because that could be soon borderline. And we include 64-bit counters, at least, in their computation. Okay. So the, our state-of-the-art review led us to select some potential primitives for these, which are the AES, of course, which is a standard, I claim it isn't really because when this great cipher was designed, memory encryption and these type of applications were never on the scope. Um, the Oxys, which is a version of AES turned into a trickable block cipher, 
I don't have to define this because this was mentioned this morning as well. I'm quite lucky today. Um, and then there is, of course, karma because I designed it to so say I want to use my own stuff. Um, and it was developed for the right size. It is a public domain, so if you want to use it, you don't have to pay anybody. It has a solid theory, in my very, very not so humble opinion, and it has been well analyzed in the main sign. There is modes of, of operation which basically have direct encryption. It means that the obfuscation path goes through the cipher, or what we call one-time pad encryption, OTP. It's very common in the industrial world to abuse this word, which means that you generate a mask. You use the cipher to generate a key stream and that it's stored to your secret. And the various types of hashing and mech mechanisms. And now I promise you headaches. A few examples will follow and there will be a lot of diagrams. I tell you one thing, um, it is to make you empathize with us because uh, we implemented all of them and many more so our headaches were even bigger. So of course we start with GCM, which is basically a counter mode followed by um, encrypted polynomial authenticator in a Galois field. That's why it is Galois counter mode. So we all know how it works. We have a key there, and we use it to encrypt an initialization vector, which can be, in this case, the memory address and the counter put together. And then for each block inside the same cache line, you, add, you concatenate also a different number, and you use it to generate, by encryption, different masks, which are then used to get the ciphertext from the plain text. And what you do, you use your Horner scheme to evaluate a polynomial in a magic value H using the blocks of the ciphertext as the coefficients of your polynomial. So take with an H, you multiply C0 by H, you add to C1, you multiply by H, and at the end then you encrypt again with the same technique, your value there to get your tag. We all know this thing or a counter mode, but you can do something finer. This is one of the beautiful ideas of, the, of Intel's memory encryption engine. Hey, the second time I say something good for you. Um, and which is to actually chop the ciphertext into blocks, multiply each one by a different secret magic value, which is generated randomly at boot, uh, and you then add all these things. The nice thing is that it can be done in parallel or pipelined. And then, of course, you encrypt these and you get a multilinear universal hash function encrypted as your authenticator. Fine. And then, of course, we have a very even more complicated thing. I don't have to describe this. Again, thank you, Tatsu, because it is OCB, which we know it is encryption, direct encryption. So you see the data obfuscation path from the P to the C goes through E, but there is some mask before and after. And this is the XEX construction, that's the XE construction. And we know it is a very, very fragile construction. But if we limit ourselves to this, it still stands on its feet. It's inefficient, but it's there. And this is just a limited set of examples of encryption techniques we can use. And of course, we can use a trickable block cipher, which we know gets you the cipher text from the plain text by using the key, which must be kept secret. But there is another parameter called the tweak, which can be even manipulated and chosen by an attacker in the security model. And they should not be able to violate um, the confidentiality of your, of your stuff by manipulating it. And so you, we get uh, the trickable codebook mood which was also seen today, we have only one key here. The data obfuscation path goes through the encryption function, but the key is always the same. There, are, there is no masking before and after, but you get your nonce concatenated with different values and a magic value here for the tag to the encryption, which is actually much simpler conceptually, at least, to see. To design a good trickable block cipher, well, let's see between us I hope I, I, I was able to, otherwise I'm in big trouble. Okay, but we can use these in a very nifty way, also to simplify some security proofs. Counter and tweak encryption. So we use the trickable block cipher to generate a key stream, to sort 
the plain text with it to get the ciphertext. The nice thing is that we use the same counter here. So when you write to the same cache line, you have to change the counter. So th but that's how you get the freshness. So the cool thing is that you use the address here. So each location in memory has its own function to generate this key stream. And it can be seen as a pseudo-random function, not a pseudo-random permutation of the nonce. That simplifies a bit the proofs because you don't have to resort to the switching, you have tighter bounds and things like that. Okay. And of course, you can do the same trick. You add a multilinear hash universal hash function encrypted, that's there, the encryption function, as an authenticator, and you get this. And there are many variants also for these, but these were just a few of these. But this was just the easy half of the story because integrity is actually much worse. So we have the Merkle tree, we have seen these, you chop the memory into blocks, you hash them, you put the hashes in some bigger blocks, you hash these until you get something that stays at the top and in order to make sure that these can't be manipulated, you store securely inside the security perimeter the tip of this Christmas tree. And then, of course, we have counter trees. Who knows counter trees? No? Well, it's a nice structure, because if you see this one, there's a problem. You can verify things in parallel. You just have to verify all the hashes. But you have to update these. You have first to hash this, and then you hash again these to get these, and then you hash all of these on the top to get a top value. So this cannot be done in parallel. So the, in Hall and Utler and then other people devised the techniques which now we call counter trees, to be able also to update these structures in parallel. And the idea is that you have a live memory region, and you have your data blocks. And you have a special region for the max. So you take your data, you have a counter associated to this data, you see each block of data has some counter, and so you put them both to input to a keyed has function, and then bang, you get your tag. And then you do that for each block. Then you have a third region of the memory, which is the counter tree region, where you actually put the counters. And these counters are put in a cache line in a little block together with their tag. So instead of being stored somewhere else, you store them all together. So you, have the ha you hash the counter above with the counters, which is the data inside your block, in order to get the little tag. And you continue. The nice thing about this structure is that it cannot only be verified in a parallel way, like a Merkle tree, but it can also be generated, recomputed, updated in a parallel way. <laughs> and the top counter stands securely on chip. And then you have this monster, which are split counters, which I only put here to show off my prowess with the ticks. And that's the same thing. You have data, you have a key to hash, and you store here in a tag. But what is all this thing, this web of things above? Instead of putting eight counters of 64 bits, say, in a 512 bit line, we put 64 small six bit things and one 64 major bit major counter. So whenever you write, say, to the zero, little c zero is updated. But of course, since it is only six bits after 64 writes, well, cache addictions. Um, these will overflow, which means that when, you, when this one overflows, you reset all of these to zero. You update the major counter, and then you have to recompute all these tags here. So you might say, well, it's a lot of work. Yes, but since the arity of the tree has increased a lot, the trees get much smaller, verifications get faster. The information about the counter is much more compact because you store 64 values where usually you store only eight, and so you reduce cash, cash pressure. And so with this nifty trick, which is from a conference in 2006, I don't remember which one, micro, I think, um, then you, you get uh, much better performance. And there are other techniques. There are the tech, the pat, and whatever you want to call them. And I even haven't started talking about variations on the theme of split counters, so don't get me into this. Still have 10 minutes, right? Yes, something. Five. Oh, my God. So too many variants. So we have no encryption, encryption only, encryption integrity tree, enter replay. We have direct or OTP encryption. We have monolithic and split counters. 
We have also the ability to say, hey, we can save in the Mac region by using, instead of just one Mac per cache line, we combine two Macs and hash them together somehow to get a, a one value each two cache lines or each four ones. And then we can verify the Macs in a synchronous way with the decryption or not. You can see there are easily about 249 different combinations we can have. It is odd because nothing has no variation. So we select some and we have them fight each other on benchmarks. The benchmarks are spec 2006 and 17 on full system emulators for the A57 and A75. The A75 emulator is a bit buggy, uh, so some tests just don't run at all. But I mean, it's, it's a little closer, let's say, for instance, to the Graviton 2 CPUs made that, that Amazon uses. They use A76, it's a bit faster. But. And we emulate the crypto hardware by inserting latencies in the data paths of the emulator. And these latencies are real world latencies because we have synthesized uh, uh, the cryptographic hardware we are going to use. So that's what you get, for instance, for the lowest level. I'm going to be very quick. You get, for instance, if you have just uh, uh, XX for AES, so similar to what AMD is doing, here, uh, 23, 24% uh, impact, uh, no, 3%, uh, sorry, and we get around about one something uh, for um, the other versions. So this is actually the cheap version, just encrypting things. So let's keep 2017. Let's make these things fight. So if you are using just simple encryption with uh, uh, next EX mode, uh, you, we have about 5%. Ah, well, this thing does not work anymore. 5%, yes, 5%. If we use Karma instead of AS128, we are really on a negligible level of 1.6%. We can use this with the freshness and split counters. We are still there. We add integrity. We increase the, significantly the, the penalty. Then we start using monolithic counters uh, we, with the direct encryption and no freshness. And then we use actually the full Santa Barbara that we have in our arsenal, uh, which is also what Intel is using, but tested here on a lot of suites. And we get about 25% performance penalty. Uh, if we use split counters, we go down to this, which is about 8.7%. If we make the granules bigger to save some memory on the max, we can get to about 10% with our granules, and then it gets a bit uncomfortable we, if we use four different cache lines into one single Mac. And you see, the, 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 the nice takeaway here is that if we go from split counters, you have the same thing, but you do the verification of the Macs asynchronous with the decryption, with the decryption um, which might open a very little window for side channels, so we have to be very careful there. We go down to about 7%. And we have more tricks to bring down to about five, actually. But I'm not allowed yet to talk about this. I'm filing a bit today. So that's actually the takeaway of this slide. With the current state of the art on the market for good protection, so what Intel is providing, we get a 26.7 performance penalty. Using split counters instead, we get down to 7.8%. What about, uh, that's the memory overhead. So we had the 25% memory, um, so slow down and 26.7% memory overhead, and here we get 7.8% uh, in memory overheads. So the takeaways. This can be my last slide or not, depending on the questions. We have done the first comprehensive comparison of the field. A paper is upcoming. We tested thousands of things. Well, no, we didn't. We selected a few, but uh, we, we, I could have shown you 25 different diagrams, and you would have had a horrible headache. We have significant improvements with respect to the state of the art, which means, for instance, with something like this, an 8.7 performance penalty and 7.8 memory overhead, they're both the psychological threshold of 10%. So that might make this type of technology acceptable in a wider sense. Sacrificing some of the feature does not give a big performance or memory overhead improvement, so it's really better to use the whole, the whole banana. What you get somehow is that the memory bandwidth, the actual memory usage, increases by 83%. We are going to use almost twice as much memory traffic as before. 
This is the only price which looks bad, but if you look at it, this translates to about less than 10% performance penalty, less than 10% memory overhead, you can accept this. So I'm almost ready. I, I want to tell you one last thing. I want to thank the NIST. Are there people from the NIST here? Yeah, so they rejected Chameleon, and for the wrong reason, um, because it was, was my system for um, encrypting memory that I uh, proposed to, um, to, the, to the lightweight standard because of a type in the spec, really. But with respect to one year ago, we have a much, much better understanding of memory protection requirements and so better techniques. So every cloud has a silver lining. Thank you, actually, I'm sincere. Uh, we will submit these techniques to your open call for modes, so it's not easy to get rid of us. But I'm really sincere, uh, your rejection actually about prevented all of us to have potentially suboptimal things in standards. So this is all I wanted to say. Can you do better? We are in new Amsterdam here. Can you do better? Well, then if you think so, slap your thookies to your work desk and show us what you can do next year in the old Amsterdam. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. Seems everybody's hungry. Thirsty. Oh, thirsty. <laughs> so, was the typo in the spec the Q in Chameleon, or? Sorry, what? Was the typo in the spec, was that the Q in Chameleon? No, 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 no. Uh, that was actually intentional. I have much worse things, I mean, um, of that like that. I mean, my, my humor sometimes gets a bit overboard. You know, it was really, I mean, I, I made a mistake uh, uh, in writing down how you compute uh, the trick separation for the authentication tag. So there was such an easy forgery that I wanted actually to take a shovel, dig a big hole, and hide myself there forever. It is not the first time I made a, make a mistake in crypto. It happens. OK, I need serious question. Oh, yeah, uh, right here. <laughs> yeah, um, on the slides that you compared the 25% uh, with the 7% from your um, crypto system, the, um, I noticed the 25% was on the 512 bits, and then 7% was on the 124 bits. Yes. I'm wondering why the comparison was not on the same level of bits. Well, because, <clears throat> so, you can do this, of course, but it's not what is now on the market. So I'm comparing what we could do, or actually we are implementing for silicon, actually, not announcing any product feature, uh, but this is what is on the market now. This exists. These all do not, but this is what could we could be aiming for, what we probably will, will aim for. That's the reason. And that also needs additional techniques to make, to make us capable of combining the max without having to do too many recomputations, which are also original ideas. So if, if Intel wanted to compete, they could um, offer 13%. I mean, we could say we go from 26 to have memory overhead to 14%, yeah. and they have actually a better, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, better uh, performance. But I would prefer to take a little hit in performance and have a nearly halving I mean, Microsoft people went gaga when they saw the, the numbers. So. so I'm not sure I understand the logic behind needing such a large Mac. After all, the um, a authentication attack can only really make sense when the machine is powered on, and the life, you know, the uptime of any machine is not usually not decades. Yes, you could use a 32-bit one. We have partners asking, why can't we do a 48-bit one? Ah. Um, this is still up to debate. So to be honest, I would feel a bit uneasy having 32 bit max. But you could have them in the bottom. Um, this is something that is still open. But since I'm not still completely secure about the actual security, sorry for this, redundancy, um, redundant redundancy, uh, I, at the moment we still test 64 bits. If we agree that having 32 bit max at the bottom is okay, then we go for that. Okay, if no further questions, let's thank all the speakers of this session.
And Tom has a quick announcement. Uh, just uh, two quick uh, announcements. I literally just found a coat check, number 230. So if you want your coat and didn't take a picture of it, you should come up and get it. Uh, and there's now a reception uh, going on uh, down the stairs uh, in the uh, smaller breakout room. So uh, please enjoy. Thank you.